Good afternoon, ASEAN, and good morning, European uh, attendees and the remaining of the world. My name is Duang Chui. I'm director of Institute of Smart City and Management, University of Economic Ho Chi Minh City, ISDM UH, Vietnam. On the event series 2021 Smart City Plus, which is organized by ISCM UH and the local and international partner, I am glad to share with you all our two days webinar with the title Blockchain for the Free and Cryptocurrencies Blockchain in Current and Future Economy. This webinar is co organized by Saxion University of Applied Sciences and collaboration with the UEH uh, University. Uh, and uh, Institute of um, Innovation, FinTech, uh, Institute, Farm Central, Techcom University, University of Bristol. In the webinar, I am sure that you will enjoy the interesting and rich experience and point of views that serve from the, our specialists. First of all, I would like to invite Professor Sando Rederich, Director of School of Economics, Financial and Management, Saxion University of Applied Sciences, for opening remark. So welcome, Professor Sandro Rederick. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, it's very inspiring to see all these movies because then you want to be part of it. <laughs> so it's very inspiring. Um, welcome today to this conference, uh, Blockchain in the Current and Future Economy, a collaboration between Saxion University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands and the University of Economics, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and other partners, of course. Uh, it's an honor to be here to talk about this beautiful initiative to establish further cooperation between the universities. And uh, as you also could see in the movie, I would like to take a, a small moment to explain Saxion's position as the oldest university in the Netherlands. In the 17th century already, there was a school of scientific education in Deventer, and that, in that institute could be considered as a forerunner of Saxion, which is, which is originally established, as you saw in the movie, in Twente in the year 1875. Uh, Saxion University of Applied Sciences is a Dutch university with three campuses in the eastern of the Netherlands and with over 29,000 students. It's one of the largest institutions of higher education in the Netherlands. At Saxion, we do mainly uh, applied research. We study the interaction between people and technology. Companies and institutions can come to us with questions or problems they have, and students and researchers from various programs work together on com complex projects. By combining knowledge and practice, they come up with new surprising solutions, uh, solutions that make life, daily life easier or uh, even more pleasant, and, and not only affordable, but also sustainable. It's very important, and not only for now, but certainly also for the future. So research, entrepreneurship, and devising solutions, that's what we train our, and coach our students in from day one. Skills that are, in our opinion, very valuable for the rest of their lives. Um, we have uh, translated the importance of our joint research into our research vision 2020-2024 with a focus on key technologies of which, for example, blockchain is an excellent example on which Saxion will also focus in the coming years. Uh, the blockchain chair is also uh, uh, one of the only and unique blockchain chairs in the Netherlands. And we also underline the importance of interdisciplinary research and also in education. For example, we have a Smart Solutions Festival, we have the Blockchain Week, we have uh, several minors with business models and blockchain, and also we have an excellence program on blockchain with our top students. Uh, related to this conference and the topics covered, we can conclude that organizations are faced with rapid and major changes. So organizations will therefore have to develop rapidly in the field of digitization and blockchain in particular, in order not to lag behind. And to achieve this, we must be aware that no organization is bigger than a problem, so you can only achieve this by working together. And I see collaboration as a great opportunity, and therefore it's an honor that we have organized this conference together with the University of Economics in Ho Chi Minh City and the other partners. This con first conference is the start of an intensive cooperation in the field of knowledge sharing, research and exchange of students, for example, or teachers or even researchers. I think this is a great step to intensify our friendship, our partnership, and our relationship. And given the number of participants of this conference, I think we will certainly succeed. I wish you much pleasure for the coming two days, and I thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sandor Redirick, for your nice sharing. So I also agree with you that now if we want to uh, go further, we have to go with the networking, the collaboration. That's why we also can support for the better education, not only in the developed countries, we also can develop uh, or help it for the better education in the developing uh, country. So on behalf of the University of Economic Ho Chi Minh City, uh, the host of webinar, I would like to invite Professor Nguyen Khak Quoc Bao, uh, the host webinar, uh, the director of, fin of FinTech Institutes, the head of the education department, UH, for the welcome remarks. So welcome, Professor Bao. Good afternoon. Uh, in Vietnamese time, Professor, distinguished guests, my colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar about blockchain, decentralized finance, and cryptocurrency. Firstly, I would like to represent University of Economic University, UEH, to send a warm greeting and thank to guests of honor, visitors, and participants who attend today's webinar. I also want to express my sincere thanks to Sakshiong University of Applied Science and ISCM for cooperating in the webinar today. Now today, Financial markets based on cryptocurrency have become part of special ecosystem with own kind of covenant on it, from centralized to decentralized finance. Why decentralized finance is coming a strong trend in economy? What the future trend of financial markets based on cryptocurrency in particular and digital money in general will be like? Draw people's attention so much. Therefore, the webinar is organized today is a good chance for all of us to discuss together and try to find out common views on future, not only tech finance industry, but also the trend of crypto economy will be climbed, as well as highlight some new occupation or job that will transform in the near future. I strongly believe that we will have new ideas, new point of view to be discussed today for this hot topic. And finally, I wish all of you would have and a lot of success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bao. Before we start the webinar, I would like to invite all of our honorable professors, experts, and audience to take a group picture. So please turn on all of your camera so we also can have the group picture. That is okay, right? All of the, our technical staff. I get it's okay. So I would like to encourage all the attendees to raise your question in the Q&A or chat box of the platform. We are very glad to receive uh, all of your questions to discuss and clarify blockchain challenge and our future economy in the panel discussion in the end of the panelist sharings. To all the panelists, I would like to remind you all, please keep 50 minutes for sharing your presentation. I know that it's not much, but we totally want to spend more time for panel discussion. That's always very interesting of each webinar. So now I would like to introduce to all of you the experiences and professional moderator of blockchain field, Professor Jean Vergor, MRE Fritz, the director of Blockchain Research Institute of Saxion University of Applied Sciences. Netherlands. Professor, professor Jan Welker has been appointed as a professor in blockchain of the Saxion University of Applied Sciences, the Netherlands, in 2019. Professor Jan is one of the persons who founded the blockchain research group at Saxion. Thank you to Professor Jan for leadership and the Saxion Blockchain Research Group today have the 30 researcher in the different area in this research group is still growing. The Saxion Blockchain Research Group is the only one research group in the field in Netherlands. Next to being the professor of Saxion, Professor Dr. Jean is the chairman and also member of the various academic community and research council. I think now I will give the stage to Professor Jean, so please guide our webinar. Welcome. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. N. 
Um, a very warm welcome to everyone to this webinar. It's nice to meet you this way, uh, on the digital way. Uh, as mentioned before, I'm a professor of blockchain at the Saxion University of Applied Science of the Research Group of Blockchain. And in the Research Group of Blockchain, we have four lines of research. Blockchain for disruption, blockchain for acceleration, blockchain for decentralized finance, and last but not least, blockchain for good. And that's also going about uh, blockchain and ethics, for example. Um, I wish you have a good and a nice webinar this day. And we will uh, start with the first panelist and the first uh, introduction about blockchain. It will be done by Chai Lin Lim. He's a PhD candidate at the uh, Saxon University of Applied Science. He's a lecturer and also a researcher. Um, Chai Lin Lim has taken is at the goal to utilize the wonderful blockchain technology, which he considers to be essentially a social and economic revolutions. For its essential purpose, securing the rights to live, liberty, and property for all. He's particularly interested in blockchain interoperability and the intersection of blockchain and philosophy. He dreams of the day when the unbanked, unbanked finally become banked and one end of a world in which seed seeds will come. Um, very warm welcome to you, Chai Lenin, and the stage is yours for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, can someone please uh, show up the PowerPoint? Yes, okay. So my task today is to to guide you through the introduction into blockchain. It will be very short, just uh, 15 minutes max. So my goal today is to answer your most pressing questions. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I think it's more important to answer your questions than just going through the PowerPoint. Um, after this uh, small lecture, you have some foundational technical knowledge of what blockchain is. And I hope that I can increase your imagination of what is possible with blockchain. I believe that the, the technology is already there. We can build a lot of things, but the things that we will build tomorrow will probably be different from our imagination that we have today. And it's so important for us if we want to think about what we can build for tomorrow, if we, can, if we want to make a better world through blockchain, that we cultivate this imagination. Um, so what is blockchain? I will explain how most people define blockchain, okay? because there are so many different ways for people to uh, to express what blockchain is. So what I will do, I will I will explain to you how most people define it. And this is not necessarily how I would define it. So most people who define blockchain, they contrast it with a central server network. Now, what is a central server network? A central network is a network in which you have a client and a server, in this case, the clients are of devices or computers that would like to make use of a service. Let's say that we would like to log in to uh, email service. And in order to log in, we need to have a username uh, or email address, and we need to have a password. Well, all this data is stored in a central server. And each time when we try to log in, we need to make a connection to the central server. Well, this, of course, leads to, well, leads to a bit of a problem because if you would like to attack the server, what you can do is you can attack the central server where all this data is stored. If you can attack it and if it's uh, down, no one can make a connection to that central server anymore, so no one can make use of this, of this beautiful email service. In other words, we also say that this central server is a single point of failure or a SPOF, S-P-O-F. And the person who administrates this server, he is a middleman. Uh, maybe he's corruptible. Maybe you can go up to him and you can say, oh, I don't like this person. Here, I give you 10 euros or $10. Uh, please remove this person from your service. So it is very prone to censorship. Okay, this is a centralized network. Now let's go to what the blockchain is. Now, within a blockchain, the data is stored on, also on the server, it's on the computer. But this computer then is, uh, uh, this, this, um, 
the data on this computer is then copied and distributed among a large network of computers. So all these computers within the network have the exact same copy of this data. If you, for example, look at the Bitcoin blockchain, you can see that there are tens of thousands of computers that store the exact same data. Well, this database is what we call a blockchain. So a blockchain is like a distributed ledger or distributed database. And if one of those computers are turned off, or if one of those computers are attacked, it doesn't have a big impact on the, on the network in general, because you can always still make a connection to one of the other 10,000 of the computers. In this case, we say that this network is decentralized. There is no central server that stores the data. No, all the data is distributed among a large network of computers. So there's also not a single point of failure anymore. If one computer is down, there's no problem. There is no trusted third party. The uh, transactions can happen peer to peer. It means that if you would like to do a transaction, the transaction can go from one computer, one device to another device. The only, the only thing you need to trust is the network itself. You need to trust that the network itself is, is working properly. Most people say blockchains are 100% transparent. This is the case for public permissionless blockchains. It's also important that there are so many different types of blockchains, right? But this is the, you know, the general blockchain that we always think of if we define blockchain. A blockchain that is open, is decentralized, and it's transparent. So if you, for example, look at the Bitcoin blockchain, which is open, decentralized, and also transparent, you can actually see all those transactions happening within the blockchain. You can see that uh, this wallet has sent one Bitcoin to that wallet. Fortunately, those wallet addresses, they are not connected to a name. There's a very bit string of yeah, very bit numbers, letters. Um, so it is still difficult to see which wallet belongs to whom. But at least you can see that it is transparent. And if you would like to prove that you have made the transaction, you can always tell the other person, look into the blockchain. Here you can see that I actually made the transaction. The beautiful thing about decentralization, and I think this is maybe the most important uh, property of a blockchain, is its immutability. Once it is stored on the blockchain, it becomes so difficult to change the data. Because if you want, if you want to change the data, you need to ask all those other computers within the network to change the data according to how you want to change it. This is nearly impossible. It means that you need to convince tens of thousands, uh, ten of thousands of computers to change the data according to how you want to change. It's also cryptographically secure and it is open source. The Bitcoin blockchain is open source, Ethereum blockchain is open source. Um, Okay, so this is in short how most people define blockchain. But it's also important to know that there are different types of blockchains. Uh, the three types I would like to mention here is a private blockchain. A private blockchain is a blockchain that is created by a single private entity, like for, for example, a bank. A bank can create its own blockchain, but most probably will not be, not be so de decentralized because the bank, I expect, would like to have full control over the blockchain. So they, they, they will probably say, oh, Shai, he's not, uh, uh, he's not a customer, so Shai will not have access to our centralized private blockchain, okay? But then you may still have a single point of failure. <laughs> and then you may have still a trusted third party, which is the bank. So it is very important to understand the different types of blockchains. The second type of blockchain I would like to, to explain is a consortium blockchain. Within a consortium blockchain, it's a group of entities who control the blockchain, who can run the computer nodes, um, who can run the blockchain on their computers. And an example of this is, for example, an example of this is uh, the DM blockchain that Facebook would like to roll out. So Facebook, they are, uh, Facebook would like to create their own, their own cryptocurrency. They're going to release it, I think at the end of this year, that's the goal. But they said, they said, okay, this blockchain will be run by Facebook, run by MasterCard, Visa, and a bunch of other companies. There's, I think Spotify, Spotify is in there as well, um, Uber in there as well. So, it, it, so it, you have maybe 50 companies who run this blockchain. It is not fully open, but it is, it's not fully decentralized. It is quite decentralized. Um, 
because it's not just one entity who owns the blockchain, but it's 50 companies, 50 entities who own the blockchain. Okay. And lastly, you have this open, fully decentralized blockchain like the Bitcoin blockchain. And what's beautiful about the Bitcoin blockchain is that everyone can run the blockchain on their own computer. All I need to do is to download a piece of software and I have the blockchain on my computer. I can help to secure the network and it's almost impossible, maybe fully impossible to close down the Bitcoin blockchain because of that. Okay, so to summarize, three different types of blockchains, private, consortium, and open uh, public blockchains. So now I would like to discuss some practical use cases of blockchain, but before I do that, we need to have a small summary of the strengths of blockchain technology. If you would like to make use of blockchain, you need to build something that utilizes its strengths, right? So a blockchain strength is that there's chance of there's less chance of server downtime. Secondly, the transactions can happen very cheap and very fast. There's no trusted third party who, who has to look at every transaction, who has to approve a transaction. Um, transactions can happen peer to peer, and that leads to very cheap and very fast transactions. In general, <laughs> because there are so many different types of blockchains, there's no trusted third party, especially in uh, the open decentralized blockchains like Bitcoin blockchain. It is uh, very resistant against censorship. And it makes use of democratic governance, especially those open decentralized blockchains like the Bitcoin blockchain. It uses some kind of democratic governance because you still want to update the blockchain. And how can you update it? You can only update it if you can reach consensus with all the other computers on the network. So you can, for example, say, okay, I would like to improve the blockchain by doing this. Uh, please look at my code. If you agree, then vote for it. And if enough computers vote for your update, then that will become the next update of the blockchain. There are also, also some weaknesses for a lot of blockchains. It's not very scalable yet. Um, but again, this depends on what blockchains you talk about. In a lot of blockchains, you cannot process too many transactions per second. Bitcoin, for example, BTC can only process seven transactions per second. It's very, very slow. I think if we would like to create mass adoption, we really need to go to hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Difficult to update. Um, I just mentioned democratic governance. The benefit is that some kind of de democracy, people, they have a say in the future of the blockchain, but it also means it's difficult to update it because you need to reach consensus. This takes time. It's difficult to change or refer to wrong data. Well, the benefit is anti-censorship, but if you want to change the data, then you have a problem. <laughs> um, in general, there are higher development costs. But also, this is something that, uh, that, that can be easily tackled. Um, it will become cheaper and cheaper over time to build applications on the blockchain. So this is my last slide. And this last slide is meant to uh, uh, spark your imagination of what is possible, right? So this is a slide from, uh, from McKinsey. And they, they identified several sectors to see in which sector blockchain is most useful. And you can see, for example, that the public sector, it, uh, blockchain can play a huge role. Why? Well, because, because in the in the public sector, you have something like blockchain-based e-voting. Uh, we have seen all we, we have seen this issue with uh, with the United States, where two parties say, "Oh no, the, uh, um, the votes are counted wrongly." But if you can vote on the blockchain, it is stored on the blockchain, it's immutable. Then no one can contest the votes anymore. Um, if you, for example, look at the, look at the, the financial services, um, blockchain can be used in um, cross-border payments. So if I would like to do a transaction from the Netherlands to you in Vietnam, I can do it, for example, through Bitcoin SV or through Bitcoin Cash or even Bitcoin, Ethereum. And it will almost automatically be settled through the network against very, very low cost. This is really, really beautiful. Um, I'm personally from Cambodia. We have a lot of Cambodian people who work in Korea or who work in, uh, in Japan or in Malaysia, and they would like to send money back to the families in Cambodia. Right now, sometimes we have to pay 8% transaction costs or sometimes 10, 15%. But if you could do it on a blockchain, 
you can do immediate settlements against negligible fees. Unfortunately, my time is already over. Um, so I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to contact uh, uh, to contact me. This is my email address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Charlie Lim, for your presentation and your insights in an introduction of uh, blockchain. I have some uh, questions, but we'll do it in the panel discussion later on. Um, so thank you again very much for your presentation and your insights. Um, now we go to the second um, presentation. It will be done by Ronald Kramer. It's about decentralized finance. Uh, Ronald Kramer is a lecturer and researcher of the blockchain research group uh, of the Saxon University of Applied Science. He's a CPA and researcher. In 2014, he started researching the Bitcoin ecosystem and education students about his this phenomenon. He's a member and a founder of the Blockchain Research School. Ronald is specialized in the public blockchains and decentralized finance. Very well, welcome, uh, Ronald Kamer. Nice to have you here. And uh, the floor is yours, and you can start with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Jan, for the for the introduction. Welcome. Uh, okay. <clears throat> and look at my sheets. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I want to give today uh, a sneak preview about uh, the things that you can study in our uh, university. And one of the things I want to discuss is uh, DeFi. Um, before I go to DeFi uh, <clears throat> and what also. Uh, Chai, uh, previous message, we have CFI. CFI is centralized finance. That means there is a third trusted party. Now, what's the problem with the third trusted party? You need always permission to access the system. And it is not guaranteed that you have permission. Another um, disadvantage of CFI is that uh, your funds can be seized by the government or um, and uh, you have to pay uh, mostly a fixed fee. So the blockchain technology uh, makes something possible. And one of the uh, challenges there were was to make uh, exchanges ob obsolete so that you have peer-to-peer -peer transactions with uh, shares or tokens. So that we call uh, DeFi, decentralized finance, so that you have peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Now, one of the things um what Chai also uh, mentioned is, yeah, what is possible with uh, blockchain? The first years, the developers started to set, uh, to put the market that was on CFI on DeFi. Now, one of the problems that they uh, saw is that, yeah, how more markets there are, how more exchanges there are, the bigger the spread will uh, be. Uh, and um, yeah, then is the problem is the adoption. So um, they need a solution for that. And the solution was uh, to skip the whole uh, uh, market with, uh, with the market makers, but that uh, you uh, provide liquidity and that the liquidity providers are uh, rewarded for the fact that they give uh, uh, liquidity. They call that automated market maker. So, uh, an automated market maker uh, is a, a recent information in DeFi that introduced a new simplistic form of market making enabled by smart contracts. So that is in this case on Ethereum. Automated market makers are smart contracts that hold assets and uh, they call that a liquidity pool and allow for exchange between those assets. I want to elaborate a little bit on that. Um, the, the, the problem uh, of uh, the exchange is solved that uh, everyone can provide li liquidity. I won't go in detail for this uh, presentation. Uh, we, we do that in the courses, but it's a very smart uh, um, uh, for formula made. They call it the constant product market makers. And it means that um, if you have um, coins in your wallet, for example, Ethereum, and let's say you have also a Bitcoin, then you can um, uh, you can give, give in consideration that you give those um, 
coins to a smart contract and uh, that a smart contract uh, will change um, when uh, someone wants to buy or sell uh, coins. Um, one of the first um, initiatives was a Uniswap that started with this. Uh, Uniswap um, uh, is now on, on this moment the most relevant, um, let's say, exchange where you can uh, swap your uh, coins, let's say Ethereum for, let's say, Bitcoin or another coin. Uh, what will happen is that um, the li liquidity pool provides the opposite uh, coin. So that is an, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, thing that has happened and is, uh, uh, that was a big innovation. And I challenge you uh, to do your own research uh, on the internet. You can find on YouTube a lot of uh, tubes about uh, how automated market making is working, etc. But one of the, um, one of the rules is that you always provide 50% um, of one coin and 50% of another coin. So let's say for thousand euros on Ethereum and thousand euros on Bitcoin. Now, that is uh, a thing that the people also uh, try to uh, solve. I want to elaborate uh, that that is in this case, um, Andre Cronje. They, uh, they are now working that you can always provide uh, li liquidity and not use the 50-50 uh, form. Why is that so relevant? If you provide liquidity and one of the pairs uh, that you provided, let's say uh, Ethereum is going uh, down in price, then you will have an impermanent loss because the liquidity pool will always be 50-50. Um, this is uh, in this sheet um, uh, explained. So in the worst case, uh, you're all, you lose all your funds if one of the two pairs uh, uh, goes to zero. Um, and uh, if um, both coins do well, but one coin is, uh, is outperforming, then you have 20% less profit, not loss, but less profit than uh, if you didn't uh, provide the liquidity. Um, one of the big problems on this moment is that uh, all the contracts are on Ethereum and because uh, of the congestion of the Ethereum network, um, you have to pay very high fees. So that is, uh, that is a big problem for the adoption. Uh, the big players, uh, they, they don't care, but for the small players, uh, it is a big issue that the transaction fee are uh, so high. So that means that there are uh, they are working on that problem by Ethereum, but there are also other teams like Phantom. They work for second layer solutions to solve the problem. That means that they uh, extract traffic from Ethereum and uh, lead that to their own uh, blockchain. Now, I also want to elaborate on uh, what is now possible with DeFi and what are the new uh, products, for example. Now, um, that Andre Cronje, that is a software developer, and um, what he did every day, he, uh, he managed an, uh, uh, his portfolio for his family. Uh, and it costs about a, a lot of money, a lot of USDC in this case. And what he did every day, that he logged in to several um, DeFi uh, projects like Aave or Compound to look what is the rate. So the, the interest rate that you can earn if you provide your uh, liquidity to uh, that uh, um, uh, project. So I made a screenshot um, of uh, Aave. Aave is on this moment the biggest uh, uh, lending site. So you can send your coins to Aave. You get an interest uh, uh, for that and Aave lends it out to, uh, to other people. What is the reward that you get? you get uh, a percentage uh, that is a variable percentage uh, every, uh, every hour, let's say, or a minute. And you get also shares of Aave in, uh, in return. Um, and that is uh, to stimulate you that you uh, put your funds in uh, Aave. The competitor of Aave is Compound. You can also get an interest on, um, on the on the Compound website, and you get also shares of Compound. You have 
also uh, other um, uh, parties like um, Green, etc. So every day, André Cronier logged in, looks where do I get the highest uh, fee and put all the money at work at that uh, uh, platform. So in this example, let's say um, the interest on uh, USDC is 2.3% uh, by Aave and uh, is um, in this case, um, 2.91 uh, uh, in compound. So in that case, he transferred all the funds to compound. The next day he logged again in and sees the opposite. So he puts all the funds out of compound and puts it to Aave. Now, having done that for a time, he thought, hey, that, this is not so smart for me. It cost me a lot of time. Let's make a program of this. So I make a, a robot program that logs in and looks where do I get the highest uh, interest fee. What is complicating is also that it is uh, it has to be a smart uh, uh, program because uh, the interest fee is one thing that you get. You get also shares from that uh, from that uh, uh, protocol. So that means that you have uh, uh, do uh, uh, a, a little bit of math to look from what is uh, bottom line, the highest uh, fee. Now, he made a program of that. Um, it, he made it for himself. Um, but later he thought, hey, this, this is not so smart that I use a program by myself. I can better share my program with a lot of other people because the interest on those uh, sites uh, differ per minute. So if I uh, give my software to, uh, to other people, and other people can also use my software, then maybe I log in at 10 o'clock, but another participant logs in at 10.15. So on 10.15, we can see again uh, what is the best return. And it is possible that uh, the participant on 10 o'clock puts the funds in a uh, compound, but that the participant on 10.15 chooses for uh, Aave. So this is a very smart program, that gives uh, that maximize the returns um, on interest, and that uh, that initiative uh, that is called Yearn Finance. You can see that in the screen. So I want to challenge you to to do uh, uh, to do research on that. It's a very uh, innovative uh, uh, program. Uh, I see it a little bit as the Goldman Sachs of uh, of a blockchain, um, and. Um, yeah, I think in the near future, uh, you uh, you put your money, uh, your USDC or, or your DAI, you will store it in a vault, in this case by your finance, and your finance will, the programmers of your finance will look where do I get the best uh, uh, return. Um, so the whole, um, I want to um, end this session. Um, that uh, my uh, tips are uh, look uh, very good at uh, at Andre Cronier. I think he is uh, he is a newcomer. Uh, I think he is very smart in the in the financial world. He's a very good uh, programmer. His uh, his initiative, UN Finance, is uh, very uh, uh, promising. Um, he also worked on uh, on on Phantom. He's one of the founders of Phantom. So in my personal opinion is that I won't rule out that a lot of programming will be done on Phantom um, as a side chain of uh, Ethereum. Um, to give you an example, Young Finance has now 4 billion assets under management. So that means that the program has 4 billion of funds of uh, customers. Now, if you look at the Uniswap, uh, Uniswap has 8 billion assets on the management. This is, is a sheet from uh, two weeks ago. So these are considerable uh, amounts. Uh, keep in mind, last summer, uh, those amounts were uh, under 1 billion, for example. So DeFi is taking off and it can be much, much more because the centralized finance world, you talk about trillions. Now, if you go to um, to uh, Coin CoinGecko or to Coin Market Cap, uh, you can um, you can look 
also in each ecosystem, who are the players? Now, this is the ecosystem uh, of the of the pools of the exchanges. Now you can see that Uniswap is on this moment the biggest, but you can see also the competitors. Now, what we do on Saxion is that we uh, uh, transfer our knowledge uh, of of all those initiatives and and the pros and the cons, etc. This was only a very sneak preview. I have mentioned, um, uh, but to give you an impression about um, the things uh, we are uh, uh, giving courses of. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ronald, for your uh, presentation and your insights. It's very nice to have you here. Uh, also, I have a couple of questions for you, but we do it in the panelist uh, discussion. And we also are receiving uh, some uh, questions in the, for the Q and A in the chat. Uh, so you're welcome uh, to give some uh, questions in the, the chat. Um, now we're going on to the third presentation. Uh, it's about financial technology ecosystems in Asia. Uh, a very warm welcome uh, to Tuan Ho. He's a senior lecturer in finance and accounting of the University of Bristol. Um, he examines how capital market participants use financial information for valuation and investment purposes. He also studies Vietnam and other Asian countries' economic policy policies through his research connection at the University of Economics, Ho Chi Minh City. He's a regular contribution on for Vietnamese and foreign media, such as Nikkei Asia, the Saigon Times, and the Vietnam Investment Review. Uh, again, a warm welcome uh, to all, um, and the stage is yours, and start with your presentation. Thank you, John. You're welcome. So, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for your attendance today. Um, today, we'll talk about the, um, the fintech ecosystem and then the regulation landscape in Asian countries, where Vietnam is one of those. So, before I start, um, so thank you for the presentation of Ronald. Um, we, we know that now with that way, um, there is a large amount of people who are joining the crypto market, um, whether that is C5 or that is D5. And based on some recent survey, we know that there are at least 25% of the millionaires, uh, millennial millionaires in the world now, they are holding cryptocurrencies. Not, not to mention are the people who are doing certain kind of uh, CFI in China, because we also know that in China, they only they don't only have DeFi, they also have CFI, and there are a huge amount of them doing that, uh, in, including people in Hong Kong and in China. So the the question we have here is how the government see this because they see that millennial who are a very important population in the next ten or twenty years are uh, jumping onto the crypto the DeFi trends. How should they regulate that? And now we take one step back and see the whole fintech regulation in the view of them. And this is the landscape of the business model of the whole fintech system. We can see that um, why people pay a lot of attention into crypto market, into uh, digital lending, they account for about 26 and 32% of what is going on in the fintech area. Why something that people are making a huge progress in the last two years, especially during the um, COVID-19 situation is we see a lot more crowdfunding on capital raising that is jumping from 10% to 21% in uh, Asian. That is surprisingly high. And then we also have uh, a jump in AI and big data in the, in the area. So looking at the overall opportunities, it's just not about the crypto market. It's not just about P2P lending. Generally, people are looking at. And so the. The question here is how do the government they will see this because they see that people are jumping onto the bandwagon. How should they regulate them overall, not just C5, D5, but then everything else? And if you look into the technology, you will also see that um, the government they will look to regulate everything 
not just blockchain technology. And if we look at the Asian fintech, actually blockchain is, people think that is kind of dominant. The fact is based on this survey, the blockchain only account for 23% of what is going on with the fintech. And based on the data I got from Bishbook, and so if for the capital raising, then about 80% of them are non-blockchain technology. So that's somehow fit with this uh, survey from Cambridge. So more actually the, the people are raising money in fintech actually focus on machine learning, predict, uh, predictive analytics, and then robotics is has a huge, um, last year they have around two, three percent, this year they have 25 percent. So that, that is a like 10 times gem of everything they have. So the, we, we need to keep all of this big picture in mind is when the government, they make the decision, they make the decision of regulating on a whole package of the fintech area, not just like blockchain area, crypto area, they will have to regulate everything in their view because they are all considered a fintech regulation. And then uh, the Cambridge Center of Alternative Finance, they make um, the uh, survey to each of the area to, to see uh, particularly on the digital payment fintech in ASEAN, which is one of the uh, big pro uh, area. And then they want to see what is the highest risk. And again, it come up very clearly that the regulate, regulatory chain risk is the highest risk considered by the digital payment uh, um, sector, which is like, and all of the other sector, including lending, including AI, they all play a role of 20 to 25%. So it means that this is the highest risk. Everything doing, everyone doing FinTech see the regulatory approach, the risk of people change the regulation is a higher risk to the business model. And this is understandable because if you think about uh, DeFi and everything else, so CFI, one of the thing is uh, why you are trying to say this is decentralized. If some company is trying to join the network and make money, they will have to uh, somehow com uh, make compliance to the regulatory and the regulatory by one way or the other will enter into the system. Whatever kind of decentralized you have, you will eventually have to face the regulation problem if people want to actually have the funding to do the projects. And then again, if you look into uh, the survey, then you can easily find out that the, the most important risk to most of the uh, people who are doing FinTech they are, they're looking into the uh, risk factors, then 80% of them see uh, regulatory framework. And more importantly, it is not really about the regulation chain itself. It is about you have the regulation, but then how do you enable your regulation? It means that I have the rules. Nobody how to in, uh, enable the rules. No, how, nobody how to enforce the rules is also another thing. And I will come to that. So they have a, what do they call the sandbox system that is trying to promote innovative innovation. However, if we look into the re reality, then we will face that the sandbox system is not as um, kind of like heaven as they think. And, and I will move to that now. Um, if you think about the ASEAN framework of regulation of the FinTech overall and the uh, crypto or the blockchain application, you can see that most of the countries, they are adopting something called is a, a regulatory sandbox initiative, which means that this is kind of a initiative that allows people to use new technology and try to, to disrupt the financial world, like uh, um, banking, like asset, uh, uh, asset management, like insurance. And among the countries in ASEAN, uh, we have many countries that they have regulatory sandbox that are operational, which means that they have some kind of authority that are there to make the rules and also to uh, operate the sandbox. Uh, one funny part is Vietnam has a regulatory initiative, which means they say uh, we will use the sandbox approach 
However, in Vietnam, that is just a proposed sandbox. It means that we have no authority actually has the power to in to execute the sandbox approach. This means that we say we have sandbox. Nobody actually tell you how it will be enforced. So that is one of the trouble that I see uh, in in the situation of Vietnam. So you can see that on on this graph, uh, Vietnam is the only one that is in blue. The main reason is in blue is because that is the only country that say I have sandbox, but then I actually that is just a proposal. There is no enforcement. And if you look into uh, the countries that really have the enforcement that is uh, has been an established one, you have uh, what they call is innovation office. So that is a specific office operated under certain uh, ministerial or departmental government uh, office that really take into uh, take, take in the decision where they, they want to allow certain initiative in, uh, for example, uh, insurance technology or payment uh, or digital payment to really be able to offer services. And uh, this is the, the approach of the countries. One, one of the trouble of this is if you look at the number of initiative that is run, that is actually born out of this sandbox, then you might be disappointed to find that about five or seven initiative actually at the moment is under operational. So I say five, uh, many of them are fine. Uh, surprisingly, Thailand is only having one or two, and uh, Indonesia is one or two. Singapore, uh, you might expect a lot, actually four or five. So the initiative, even though you have the sandbox, uh, this is not really a sandbox. This is, uh, they draw a borderline and then people have to make application to what they can do. And then you will, you will ask, so why do you so strict on that? Why don't people allow such a kind of sandbox approach? Then uh, I, I move to this one and you will see clearly um, why that is the case. You can see that uh, in many of the countries like Thailand, Singapore, and Indonesia, they get regulation on everything. So we have P2P lending, equity crowdfunding, digital payment, uh, cryptocurrency, and also insure tech, they all have regulation. But then you will see the keywords here, bespoke. Bespoke means that that is the keyword for the sandbox, which means that I have something new and I bring to you and say, let's regulate it so I can offer the services outside. So people will make the decision based on case by case. And because that is case by case, it's not very clear how this thing will be made uh, and uh, how, how this thing will be allowed. Uh, interestingly, uh, if you look at the case of Vietnam, uh, we have much relaxed regulation. Uh, uh, we have only three areas that is regulated. That is equity funding, uh, digital payment, and uh, insurance technology. The others we have unregulated, which is quite actually look to be uh, free to do. But then if you look into the reality, then most of the business tell me that they can't do because there is no regulation. When you don't have any regulation, uh, they they stuck in everywhere they want to operate the business, so that's one of the problems. So then I, I talk to people and then I I do kind of research on how the fintech will has impact on some traditional institution, and I find out something that might explain why the regulator they might they they might be uh, concerned about that. So we did this one is we try to uh, calculate the fintech presence in the market and we calculate the performance of the banks in Vietnam when they are fintech present on the previous year. And we find that on the first line, you can see that whenever they increase in the fintech present, the performance of the traditional bank go down. Uh, in, in all measure, ROA, ROA, net uh, interest margin, you, uh, and then we also have risk taking behavior increase as well. So generally, it means that when you have fintech, they kind of compete with the traditional uh, institution, which is consistent with what we know, because we have a new guy coming in and disrupt the economy. They disrupt the business model. The trouble with this is they disrupt the safety of the bank, and they also disrupt the risk-taking behavior. 
which will affect the view of the regulation uh, of the regulators. They are worried that the, the presence of the fintech might actually disrupt the economy or the banking system. And that is one of the key concerns I have is uh, there need to be a different approach to this because if we look into this one, then uh, we need to persuade the regulators how the benefit will outweigh the cost. Final thing, um, I think the, the regulator, they also worry when they see situation like this. Uh, when we talk about DeFi, we see that, um, like Ronald say, eight, nearly, uh, 8 billion money locked into Uniswap. We also have about uh, nearly 10% of them are going under some kind of uh, hacks or, or tests. And we have DeFi tests that start back last year because DeFi start very early last year, they will come to increase. And we have about 129 million in DeFi tests. This year, the number is increasing 40% of last year number just in the first four months. And then we are uh, looking into situation that we are likely to have some bank run in the system. So when, when Ronald say about um, liquidity, providing liquidity, that is interesting. And that is like, you are looking, uh, you, you have some uh, excellent application looking into the interest rate of different defined on the network. And one of them is, I'm, I'm sure that they will actually, the, the program will point you to T10 because it offer one of the highest interest rate in the market a few days ago. And then you can see that the, because of that, many people will deposit the money into T10. And the price of T10 moved from $3 to $60. And especially in one week, you can see that it go from $10 to $60. So in one week, you are making 600% of your money. And in less than 24 hours, you lose everything. And uh, you can see that the price dropped from 60 to exactly nearly zero. Everyone run out of the bank. This is the fastest bank run I have ever seen in my life. In uh, just about 24 seconds, everything is gone. So the bank is completely bankrupt in a very quick 24 hours. And this is a concern. If I'm a regulator, I'm looking to this, I will be concerned because if I allow a very normal person without any understanding about cryptocurrency to deposit the money into this, and if they lose money, what will be the regulator approach? How you will see this situation? And how the people who are studying a blockchain and other things like us will be able to inform them that what kind of approach you should do to regulate who can put money into this what kind of information we should provide people. This is not enough to say, uh, you need to uh, be aware that you may lose everything. UK has that approach. They come out and say to people, whenever you enter into a crypto system, then there will be a message telling you that if you put money into this, you may lose everything. And guess how many people deposit money in? A survey recently in the UK say 4 million of them which is nearly 10% of the workforce uh, putting money there. Whatever the central bank say, the people put money in there. But then if there's something wrong with that, people will blame the regulators. And that is the burden the regulator is facing at the moment. So uh, to wrap up my talk, uh, generally, I think FinTech is the future because this disrupts many things that the traditional banking and asset pricing, asset uh, management industry are doing. Uh, it's just like robot advisor is changing the landscape of the stock broker system and asset pricing uh, and asset management system. But then the problem is the regulatory risk is high and people try to help this by building some idea of sandbox. But then I feel that the sandbox approach is more for in some country, it is more like you kick the can down the road. Like you, I don't know how to regulate this. So I just say I have a sandbox and you should apply through the sandbox system. And then I will, I will consider this and I don't know how uh, to deal with that. And you need to uh, also, I'm, I'm talking to people in FinTech area and they say you need to keep in mind that blockchain is only one part of the technology that is currently available. There are new technology that is currently uh, get developed every time. And uh, 
in the first talk, we also know that blockchain has a problem of scaling, and they have some other idea of other technology that will be able to scale more quickly. And we need to be able to more open-minded. But then in a one or two years time, I see that probably blockchain or uh, robot advisor is, is where the, the market is moving toward. And then the regulators need to have a view of how to balance the benefit with the drawbacks. And uh, thank you for very much for your um, attention. Thank you very much, uh, Tuan, for your presentation. Um, I also have a couple of questions for you, but we do it in the panel discussion. Uh, before we start with the last but not least uh, presentation, uh, some comments. Um, uh, some comments uh, from, uh, for the panelists. I have to change my glances in just a minute. Um, it's for the panelists. Um, there are some questions uh, that could be answered in the Q&A session. However, during the webinar, you also can go to the Q&A chat box in the lower right corner of your WebEx windows to answer directly some question. To answer a question, first you need to click to the specific question in the line that writes your answers. You can choose to send your answer privately or not. Thank you very much. And now we start with the last but not least uh, presentation by of uh, about uh, cryptocurrencies uh, slash asset currency and future trends. It will be done by Dr. Henry Alasham Shai. Uh, it's nice to meet you again. This way we met each other before in another webinar. It's nice to see you here again. Um, nice to see you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, since 2011, Henry is a researcher in Telecom University School of Economics and Business. He's the founder of the lab, Social Computing and Big Data. He was director of Digital Business Ecosystem Research Center from 2018 until 2020. He's also the founder and president of the Socio Illuminum Data Indonesia. Sorry for the pronouncing. Um, the only for formal association of data scientists in uh, Indonesia. Um, he has some research interest, uh, some examples about co social computers, social network, complex network, uh, network science, big data, data science, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and also about business models and not last at least uh, blockchain and blockchain opportunities. A very warm well welcome here, uh, Dr. Andre. And uh, thank if you can share your sheets, then the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Jan. Prof. Jan, yeah, thank you. We meet again in this yeah. other occasions. Thank you for nice uh, introduction. Thank you for uh, ISGM uh, that, and other partners also as well that arranged this uh, wonderful seminar. So I will present my presentation about uh, cryptocurrency and crypto asset. And mainly I will talk about uh, uh, DeFi. <laughs> and also a stable coin and also uh, about uh, CDBC. Okay, um, so let me see. Yes. Okay, so um, so actually I'm a, I'm a, okay. I'm sorry for, I, I didn't get used to it with Webex. Actually, I'm a researcher mostly on a, a computer a data scientist. So, but uh, in the last of three years, I will be doing a lot of uh, research on blockchain technology in my in our lab, social computing and big data, which is the main objective is to uh, to measure or quantify human behavior. But we see a lot of potential in uh, blockchain technology, especially in Indonesia, where where we have a a growing uh, market, um, a millennial generation that use uh, online transaction that most of them uh, like uh, Dr. Tuan, Dr. Ho say that many of uh, young generation make a, a investation, invest, investment in a crypto space. This is quite interesting. So that's why we also dig in this uh, research area. So I would like to thank you to uh, Dr. Lim, also a uh, Dr. Kramer, that uh, give a nice presentation in the first thing about the blockchain underlying technology and also about DeFi. So we, I talk 
a little bit covering both side of the talk in the previous by both presenter. So actually in, in Indonesia, we have um, uh, uh, and anywhere I see that we have uh, like uh, in the first video, we saw that uh, ISTM showed that a smart city, etc. We see that a lot of technology um, uh, uh, make uh, our our life better, more efficient in, in industrial and economic and also in, soci in society. So uh, our thing in the lab is that we need a three technology that uh, covering or uh, become uh, uh, fundamental to the growing uh, gener next of generation, which is called uh, big data, which is where we collect a lot of data and then AI with where we doing a lot of automation around the data that we get and also a blockchain where we give the rules upon all the methodology, all the rules that we implement based on the uh, digital activity. So this is quite interesting. That's why we need, we think that we we go at the same time uh, learning about big data, AI, also blockchain, and we combine three of this area. But uh, still, we're still in the progress. Uh, we still a lot of things to learn uh, also from this uh, uh, seminar, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, blockchain technology also already uh, present by Dr. Lim. Here uh, we have a decentralized peer-to-peer, -peer, which is uh, uh, something new that uh, uh, integrate that makes uh, exciting because all of the power give to the uh, audience or to the uh, contestant of the uh, economic activity. We have also order record. We also have temper proof uh, that uh, the the record of the blockchain, uh, the record of the activity, activity, economic activity is cannot be tempered because of the mechanism of the security uh, of the blockchain, like uh, proof of work, and then also encryption and hashing, also the consensus that we work on the uh, blockchain. Uh, so we have a, a DLT, yeah, distributed ledger technology that. Uh, increase trust and uh, remove of intermediary yeah in the in the in the traditional um, uh, traditional uh, economic activity uh, we see that a lot of intermediaries including regulate regulator come to the active to the uh, economic activity and make sure that everything going as the plan or uh, pro to protect the people etc and also the most powerful part is about the smart contract, which is uh, Dr. Kramer already said that we can do uh, many innovative way to create a, a, a automated um, a smart contract, such a, a, a market maker, etc. Okay, that we see that uh, in the early of, in the 2017 and 2018, we have an ICO craze that people a lot of talking about blockchain and ICO, initial coin offering, but turn out not many of them is uh, uh, not in legitimate business or scam. So this is make the audience to be careful about the blockchain uh, are so that they, they want to go there. So in this, in the last year after uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, COVID uh, we have a, explosion in decentralized finance then using that the same technology of the blockchain yeah. uh, so we get the area where we use all the uh, advantage of the blockchain to implement on the uh, decentralized uh, finance we have uh, where we can move asset 24 7 also we can create a, a settlement etc any activity uh, 24 7 also we have infrastructure is open and we open to any liquidity without uh, uh, going through several uh, regulation or requirement and also we have a protocol which is uh, can be adopted to any of uh, usage or any of uh, application and also we have a startup cost which is uh, low and also um, uh, we can we can explore our creativity to create a capture value from that. So there's a uh, many real world application about DeFi, which is uh, some of the previous presenter already mentioned, remittance, loan exchange, trading, and also some of the uh, 
uh, services or application, we have a compound, Uniswap, already mentioned before, uh, Augur also, and then uh, MakerDAO, et cetera, et cetera. So this is uh, uh, becoming a new trend uh, after COVID, yeah, 2020, and right now, we can see in this next slide, so we see that the total lockup value of uh, 10 DeFi protocol yeah, uh, from the list from the left, from Maker to Yearn Finance is explode in explosion since July 2020. Yeah, so there's a uh, because many people cannot go outside do uh, to to the bank or to the other financial institution. They do it on the com on their computer. So lending and decentralized exchange. Uh, the factor of DeFi explosion in 2020, yeah. Uh, we have seen that uh, there are six protocols that have a value over $1 billion. So we have uh, other freedom to apply composability, which is actually the smart contract can uh, uh, can uh, connect it one another, yeah, uh, can connect it uh, one another. Uh, permissionless way and also constantly talking and also leveraging each other code and also each other utility. So this is something new, yeah. Uh, and then this rapid experimentation from the all of the DeFi led the rise of many exciting projects that we can see. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Kramer already said about urine finance, etc. So I think that is a very good example. So when when we see many of the uh, DeFi project runs on Ethereum, so the Ethereum become main main platform of them to do all of the uh, uh, DeFi activity, which is resulted in the uh, rising of gas prices. Uh, Dr. Kramer already mentioned before. So the, this is uh, the 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 initiation or the the reason why we have oh, sorry why we have new ethereum version ethereum version 2 which is a roll up since uh, uh, 2020 yeah uh, beacon, beacon chains and shard chains it, actually this is increasing the scalability of the ethereum so the, before that ethereum only can uh, handle a handful maybe 30 or 40 uh, transaction per second now we go to the a thousand, ten thousand, or hundred thousand transaction per second. So this is one of solution that makes um, uh, 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 a support technology supporting that uh, uh, in in the face of uh, uh, DeFi explosion. So this is quite a new, um, uh, a good news for us. Yeah, and then we also have. Um, okay, crypto asset. I, I I will talk a little bit about crypto asset. So it's a it's a it's a family of uh, uh, asset based on uh, uh, crypto, yeah, crypto, uh, crypto, cryptography. So there's a a bit uh, uh, moving definition between 2018 and right now. Where we have 2018. We have a cryptocurrency. We have a platform token, which is a token that use on uh, a certain platform that that support the activity on the platform. We also have utility token that uh, we use token to to uh, to use uh, a future future uh, future function of the application something like that. We have also transactional token, and then in uh, to, in the recent uh, 2020, we have an, another type which is security token, which is similar like ICO. Yeah, where, where we we get the, like a like a stock of the company. <laughs> yeah, and also we have stable stable coin, which is currently just uh, uh, show up, yeah. Uh, getting momentum is in, in 20, uh, 2020 where uh, we have uh, a rising prices of uh, high volatility of the Bitcoin, then we see uh, higher, high, high, uh, high, uh, high adaptability of uh, uh, stable coin. So I, I will uh, explain later. So the, the the cryptocurrency itself is a, a, a digital, yeah, digital currency that secured by cryptography. And also, um, there are two things that important in cryptocurrency: uh, is impossible counterfeit, and uh, one 
one uh, property of blockchain is uh, 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 it uh, a double spending problem. So we can use this without uh, a problem of double spending, spending the, the same money twice or more. Yeah. And then um, most of the cryptocurrencies uh, based on blockchain are around 8%. There is, uh, but uh, this cryptocurrency um, uh, have uh, have a high volatility. Yeah. So you can see on the right side the price is so uh, uh, up and down. Yeah. And then we have a stable coin, which is um, uh, there are several kind of stable coin which actually solve the problem of the volatility. But uh, some backed by backed by uh, fiat, fiat currency, yeah, fiat currency, and then also from the uh, using commodity, also can do like a crypto, and also by algorithmic, which is uh, algorithmic means that using smart contract to make the price of the price of the stable coin close to the uh, pack uh, 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 currency. Yeah, usually uh, one dollar or something, one euro or something like that. Yeah. So um, and then uh, this. Another, I'm sorry, I have a problem with my laptop. Okay, another uh, exciting uh, project is uh, in the cryptocurrency and crypto uh, asset, asset uh, in general is a CDBC, which is uh, a, a, a move from government to respond against a decentralized cryptocurrency adoption. Yeah, so because uh, like in Indonesia, many people invest in in in, in cryptocurrency. Yeah, uh, crypto token like Bitcoin, etc. But uh, uh, some some uh, e-commerce need the digital money to exchange the value, but some other for using for investment. So the the government can regulate on the investment because there are regulation from inf invest investment activity, uh, which crypto can be uh, uh, reg. Uh, uh, allowed and which crypto uh, services uh, not allowed. So this is uh, there is a confusion in the regulate the regulator. So um, so there's a CDBC actually there is a many uh, advantage like uh, uh, efficiency uh, especially for for uh, for retail yeah for retail uh, also for wholesale, wholesale yeah uh, bank to bank uh, uh, transaction. Also, also um, uh, financial inclusion for many uh, uh, citizen. Also, uh, preventing illegal uh, activity, yeah, money laundering, or, uh, terrorism, or something like that. There's uh, also in in the world we can see that only handful of country already launched the project. This is we can see that. Um, uh, Gra uh, Cambodia and uh, Bahamas, but others still in the pilot projecting. So there's a lot of uh, issue in CDBC, uh, including how how we integrate to the current uh, system, uh, current uh, economic activity. I will I will I will explain later in the in the back. How about Indonesia? Um, sorry, Indonesia itself? yeah, Doctor Emmett, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yes. But can yeah. you close your um, presentation in one or two okay. minutes um, to the okay? So I yeah, I will show it about the in, in trend. No, of, no, no. Uh, okay. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, the trend is we see that uh, distributing ownership of uh, in DeFi in DeFi uh, like yield farming of liquidity mining to distribute it, to distribute token. We can see that uh, already explained by Dr. Kramer. Yeah. A protocol token launch uh, provide cash flow and governance to the community. We can see this one uh, happen uh, to the many uh, DeFi project, yeah, and then also testing distribute ownership of in large scale, yeah, and then also comp composability is uh, is a incentive, a, a good incentive for people to adopt the DeFi project, and also in stable coin we see that uh, use of uh, many stable coin in uh, derivative market also uh, there is a lot of in issuance in a new uh, stable coin like uh, USDC and DAI yeah also there's also uh, there's a lot of uh, wallet or infrastructure infrastructure that ready to to 
to adopt this one. And also there is a, a regulation issue still remain, especially in, in Indonesia. Uh, and then I think, uh, yeah, I think I will already explain most of the <laughs> detail in my presentation. I'm sorry if the time is quite too long. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Okay, no problem. You're welcome. And thank you very much for your presentation. Um, now we're going on with the panel discussion. Uh, we have four uh, people in the panel. Um, I have some questions for you, but first I want to start with a question for Chai Lin Lim. Um, when you look at your last year about opportunities for industry, can you have an expectation how fast the development is in blockchain in Vietnam? The Netherlands or worldwide? Could you answer those uh, question, Chai Linen? Um, yes, of course. Um, so, um, how, how fast uh, adoption adoption will be within those countries, right? Yeah. Um, I think that I think it's very difficult to say uh, to talk about the adoption of uh, adoption of blockchain because blockchain is such a big a big concept. I think it's more interesting to look into the different sectors within blockchain. So, if you, for example, look within uh, uh, blockchain in uh, use of blockchain in supply chain or blockchain in in um, uh, as a cryptocurrency, I think that um, in the very short term we will probably in the next five years we, that blockchain will be massively will be massively adopted, but it will be mostly starting in the field of uh, central bank digital currencies. Um, I know that the ECB wants to create their own central bank digital currency before 20, 2026. Uh, China has its own, Cambodia has its own. So I think that this will happen on the short term already. Um, but that the blockchain will be used for, I don't know, cloud computing or for any other things. I think that that I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it can take it can take longer, but I'm quite confident that the first uh, sectors that will be adopted will be because of central bank digital currencies. Okay, and do you think there's a difference between the development in Europe, Asian, or uh, USA or Russia? Um, I know that the, in Europe they're very slow, so I think 2026 is, is extremely slow. Uh, China already is moving, making uh, great strides. Um, Cambodia, we, our team in Cambodia, we actually helped the National Bank of Cambodia to develop the Balkan dollar, so it's already used for interbank settlements. Yeah, and I, I think that the the develop the developing world they feel more need to innovate because they want to catch up with the West. So yeah. my experience says that probably uh, a lot of innovation, a lot of adoption will come from the developing world, because the the, the already developed world they think oh, yeah, our our system already works now, so they don't see the need yet to uh, implement it. Okay, thank you very much. And now I will go to Ronald Kramer. Um, uh, what are the, uh, no, just the first question, sorry about that. Uh, but how fast is decentralized finance is growing? Is it also fast as development of blockchain or? Yeah, I think it is exponentially growing. Um, and um, Yes. Now, let's say uh, last summer there, there there was a DeFi infrastructure, but there was no asset under management. If you see how many assets under management there now is, I think asset under management is a good uh, criteria. Um, and then I think uh, it will it will uh, go on like this way. Uh, the only hurdle now is the the high fees from from Ethereum, um, but I don't see any uh, lim uh, limitations. In the near future, yeah. So also, 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 keep, yeah, also keep in mind that the big benefit of DeFi is that you can twenty four seven can do transactions and swaps. So maybe you can say that the development is going very fast. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, another question to Chuan Ho: uh, What are the most interesting developments in fintech for the coming years? I think for me, uh, it is more uh, from from 
people are working with, uh, I think the more interesting is more about uh, uh, big data analytics, uh, artificial intelligence. I think um, I think I, I see the growth in that area is very high. And and if you look into um, what happened on the recent uh, funding round is we see a lot of artificial uh, intelligence firms has been able to raise money. And we see also that we have companies like Palantir, they are saying that they might actually use the uh, superior AI technology they have to, to help um, the financial customers. So I think um, that is an area where I see FinTech is most likely to see a huge jump uh, because they that is a real way there. If if you can make a system that can make more efficient asset allocation without a hundred few hundred thousand uh, a year salary uh, asset manager, then that will be a superior uh, outcome for everyone. So I see that this is an area of fintech. I see the most uh, growth area. The other is robotic uh, application. Because mm -hmm. I uh, I think is uh, uh, when you when you can get rid of the middle person, and then you can replace by robotics, and then uh, that is uh, likely to be increase the efficiency for the firm and also for customers. For example, I myself I have just sw switched my insurance policy from a uh, traditional insurance mm -hmm. into uh, uh, a more new technology insurance uh, platform online, and that saved me around forty percent of the fees. So why not? Everyone is better off. Yeah, uh, but when I uh, make a remark on, on robotic application, and uh, what do you think about the adoption of it? Is it could be um, also difficult for some parties uh, to adopt this kind of system of robotic applications? Um, I think in Europe we have particularly difficult uh, uh, in that because. Uh, like my university, for example, mm -hmm. there are people who offer some services to the university, but then the union will oppose that because that will result in loss of works and jobs. Uh, so uh, there are hurdle on that. Um, we also know the political landscape is not always favorable for this. Yeah. But then uh, there are recent studies say if we look into the general wage of the low uh, low skill worker, and then this is surprisingly that during the COVID-19, although the robotics, uh, the automation application in increase, we also see the increase in the wage of the people who do low skill job. It means that people lost job, but then everyone, but then people who keep the job will be able to get higher paid. And then would that be, better off to leave the problem of job loss into the social system to to deal with and then keep moving on with the technology is some question that is my colleague in uh, labor economics and others will have better answer than me but then from the perspective of efficiency i i see a huge potential but then from the perspective of, of regulators of, obviously they have to keep to balance this if they have a lot of job loss, then how do we how how do we deal with that? Is is one something they need to care about? So um, yeah, I understand that. But, but what you see by innovation, uh, there are also going to be lost jobs. Uh, that that's clear. But also there are going to be new jobs and, and a new profession. Um, so I don't think it's going to be a huge problem. Uh, but it's not the kind of stuff as you can mention it that way. For another job and then another skills and etc. Um, then I will go to Dr. Andre. Um, I don't know if you know Coinbase. Do you know Coinbase? Yes, yes, I, I know. I know Coinbase. Yes. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. Um, yeah. It's it's very yeah. nice to follow that because Coinbase is a company who has currencies, and you can buy a piece of this company, but you don't buy a crypto. Uh, what do you think yeah. about this development? Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, it's quite uh, exciting what this idea coming from the Coinbase. Yeah, so I see that uh, I follow the news back in maybe a uh, couple of months, uh, maybe several years, uh, maybe one years ago, or maybe that is. Um, I think there is a the 
there is an ur urgent from the community to open a financial system ya yeah. si they launch in 2018 open financial law everyone can go uh, can can invest in easier way but also uh, this is uh, a way to grow the their ecosystem yeah their ecosystem so they they offer uh, a part of their uh, uh, company to the public this is a uh, similar like uh, security token that already uh, launched when in the in the ICO era so there's a uh, is a part of the company that can be buy and then we have a we have a trusted or uh, to, uh, uh, a trust to the to the company that that we can uh, uh, use it uh, using our uh, token so i think yeah i think it's innovative because uh, right now there's a lot of people want to to invest uh, 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 there's some money uh, going out going around that they need a new way to invest yeah uh, then then uh, i think is i we will see something like this uh, more in 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 the future uh, especially uh, i think there's not many in indonesia but i think can be uh, like uh, inspiration to do the same thing like a coin biscuit okay you can also mention it's uh... Um, the next stage of development in, in currencies. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe another question for Charlie and Lim. Uh, um, you know, a lot of uh, uh, currency, I, I thought, and, and what do you think about the difference between uh, different currencies like Bitcoin BTC or Bitcoin SV or some other of DM? Um, what do you think about the difference between them? Okay. Um... I think that yeah, there are right, so many different types of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, the cryptocurrencies that I like the best are cryptocurrencies that cannot be regulated. I know that there are some benefits of regulation, but um, I believe that we don't need regulation at all. I think that in the end, um, we should just allow people to make mistakes. If they if they lose the money, then it's their own it's their own fault. They they, they have responsibility over their own decisions. Um, but it also gives people the you know the opportunity to learn from their mistakes in their lives. So preferably um, I hope that those open decentralized cryptocurrencies like uh, uh, BTC, Bitcoin SV or Bitcoin Cash, uh, Ethereum and many others that they will become extremely successful. And that we will use these to outcompete national currencies. Because I see a big link between power and uh, money. If you give the government and the central bank to issue that they have the power to issue money we give them so much power over our lives in the end i want the people to decide the money they want to use why should the Dutch government tell me i should not use bitcoin or that i should not use bitcoin as for yours i should, should not use Ethereum. it's my own choice it's my own life if i if i don't like to use the euro then let me be leave me alone that's in short my my, my answer but it will be a very big struggle because I, I, I really see that there will probably be, be a, some kind of a crypto war, a war in which uh, governments will try to regulate it. And uh, on the other side of people who try to avoid this regulation. And who yeah. will win, I don't know, yeah. but I know the side I am on. Okay, thank you for your reaction. Uh, Ron, do you want to say something or? So, yes, I, I want to add something. Okay. Um, um, if you look at, let's say, uh, the whole topic about GameStop, for example, uh, uh, if there is regulation, um, then the regulators uh, say that we make the regulation uh, to, uh, um, to, 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 to help the little guy. But in the end, the regulations are for uh, Wall Street and for the big guys. Um, the beauty of uh, blockchain is that it is not uh, reg that it is not regulated, and that everyone has the same rules of the game. So for Wall Street and for the normal uh, man, and I think that is a, a big win. And they have also, um, and what also is a big win is that the transparency uh, of the information. So in the old system. For example, the short positions are only uh, available uh, real time for uh, for uh, Wall Street, but the little guy has to wait 10 days before he gets the information. In blockchain, you will have 
everyone has the same opportunities and has the same info. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have another question for all of you. This, uh, um, uh, oh yeah, th th that's about regulation and government in relation to DeFi. What do you think about the regulation of government in relation to DeFi? Um, who can I ask this question? Uh, I, let's say, if I may, um, I think that there will be a kind of uh, regulation. Uh, for example, Aave. Aave has a license in London uh, from the financial authorities, because if you want to make the bridge between uh, the ecosystem of blockchain and uh, fiat, uh, you need one way or another, you need a, a, a kind of license. Okay. And, uh... We talk about uh, ecosystems, and I have a question for Tuan Ho about the ecosystem. Um, ecosystems could be very different. Uh, can you explain what the opportunities are of uh, different ecosystems, as far as you know? Um, I think let's let's take the um, let's take the Bitcoin um, or like ETH ecosystem as an example. So we have an, an ecosystem where we have different layers and apps. This, this is where people will be able to have a platform where they can develop whatever business they like on that. So, so that is what I would define as an ecosystem. You can have defined, you can have other kind of application later on, uh, as long as you can use the platform you are only, only provided by the technology that's available. So this is like internet is another ecosystem. So we have the internet and we can build e-commerce, like we can build online banking, we can build other things. So the um, the ATH or the blockchain application is another kind of ecosystem that you can build whatever idea you have. So I'm, I'm excited about the idea. I'm um, I'm a, I'm playing games sometimes, so I'm, I'm excited about that people have projects of on ETH that we we have um, uh, the tokens that for people playing games and then so um, that is for example one of the idea that's brilliant uh, and, and the problem with the ecosystem is um, eventually any ecosystem from my point of view we will need some kind of regulation and and actually the ecosystem of blockchain already have uh, the, the the governance itself. I don't I don't use the term uh, regulation. I use the term governance. And the governance of a system is already uh, decentralization governance system. We know that people make votes all the time on on, on the system. But then uh, we need to be aware that that world need to be connected to the world that is traditional. People are still operating. And then uh, the regulation will, will will kick in on that part on that part, and how the governance of the ecosystem will 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 adopt the traditional governance, which is regulation, is interesting to me. And we need to see that uh, we can't rule out them. We, we we need to find a way for them to to live together. So that's that's how I understand it. Okay, thank you very much, Duan. Uh, we also have some questions uh, in the chat. Um, I first want to check uh, at the first question. Um, you can answer all if you want to. But the first question is, what is one coin valued at? By the amount of electricity consumed or by the amount of information to deal with it? Who can answer the question? Yeah, I thought that I let them answer this in the chat, but I but I think it's um it, it goes all the way back to different theories of uh, where value comes from. You know, in the past, the economists, the philosophers, they always thought that value comes from the the labor that we put into it. So it's called the labor theory of value. And then later, from 18, 1880s, we believed in the subjective theory of value. I think and that's what I believe is was that value ultimately comes from supply and demand, and it's something in our mind. So if you believe that electricity determines the value of a coin, then you believe in the labor theory of value. But I think this theory is wrong. Um, this was the theory that Karl Marx had, that Adam Smith had, and I think it has been proven wrong. 
Um, so my answer would be the value is just totally subjective to everyone. Uh, everyone. So the, this iPhone, I may value at a thousand dollars. Ronald may value at six hundred dollars. Jan at eight hundred. Right, because we have different uh, priorities, different uh, perspectives of what something should be valued at. Yeah, you, you can explain it also as uh, what what the ethic value is, or what the economic value is, or what uh, the business values of or something else. We also have uh, different uh, views about what value is and what we understand about uh, value. Okay, um, question two. Uh, proof of work consensus mechanism is better of proof of stake. Ronald? Uh, you're muted, sorry. Yes, I think indeed that proof of work is uh, is a better system. Um, uh, I think that proof of stake is ultimately a trade off uh, to keep the system. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, smaller, um, so so uh, so faster. So to keep the system faster, uh, they uh, use proof of stake. But if you do a deep dive in proof of stake, uh, there are uh, yeah there are a, a lot of uh, assumptions uh, that uh, that if they go wrong, uh, then yeah then there then there could be transaction loss of their. Uh, it is a little bit easier. To 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 get a fraudulent host, for example, but um, yeah, I think uh, proof of work is is the best one. But yeah, it's uh, it's a lot. Uh, it's consuming a lot of uh, electricity. Okay, thank you, Ernst. Um I have another question, but I think it would be nice to Henry to ask this question: uh, Where where the why is there a blockchain with an infinite number of coins? And why is there a blockchain with there are only fewer and fewer coins? Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think it's um, maybe uh, another panel can add my answer because uh, I, as far as I know from my perspective, is that uh, this is uh, uh, related to the the value of the uh, representation value of the uh, token itself. So we, we say that. Uh, like a Bitcoin, we have a limited supply of a coin means that the, the price is always going up. Not not uh, there are not many coin available in the market or um, or uh, coin itself is hard to get. So this is the way to balance the the the, the market. So uh, like uh, if we have unlimited supply of coin, uh, some will see that. Oh, uh, there's so many coin. Then to sum the value of the my my coin is uh, sometimes come, become non-existent or something like that. So, because so many people hence hand, uh, the same amount of coin. So I think this is uh, back to the design that uh, the blockchain or the the coin uh, wants to uh, make the mechanism of market mechanism something like that. Okay, thank you very much. And I see yeah. another question. Uh... In the chat, it was for uh, Dr. Tuan Ho, but you answered also it in the, in the chat, but maybe you can explain it more. Um, the question was based on the Titan chart, the price decreased to zero in one day. Can you explain what kind of hack that already happened? Can you explain it more than you did it in the chat? It's possible? Yeah, um, so in the in principle, this is not really a hack. This is more about because of the design of the token. Um, this is more that this is tied to another token. Is it is tied to the the iron, and, and then when when you actually when when people actually bring more iron, they also issue more titan. So suddenly, I have a lot of titan my in in my wallet for no reason because I hold iron, and then. Up to some point that I have so many Titan because I'm on a lot of iron. Then what I will do very logic, very uh, normal is I will sell this thing because I see that the price increased to sixty, and I have a lot of them. And then suddenly a whales who hold a lot of Titan sell it. Everyone will just sell it. And when the price drop quickly, then there's a problem with the system, 
that the smart contract stopped working. And that's where people start to be panic and then jump into trying to get as much as tightened out of the system as possible. And eventually, uh, when when you have the, the very normal liquidity run, then that's, that's drop to zero. And that is the explanation. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And you have comments? Go ahead. Uh, if I may ask, yeah, it, it's more a flaw in the concept and in the code. Uh, and uh, that's the, what I told about, about here in finance, for example, that the reason that, uh, that Andre Cronier shared his, uh, his, his software um, is also um, that other people will look after his uh, uh, software and to get the bugs out. So the whole Yearn Finance ecosystem is a system of very smart uh, uh, people that also uh, review the codes. But in the end, uh, yeah, if there's a flaw in the code, then then uh, there is always a smart person that will uh, that will make a use of it. I must also say um, there was uh, in the cover protocol, that's an insurance protocol. There was also a hack, um, but they returned the money uh, and they uh, made the hack purely. Uh, to to satisfy their ego that they can do it, um, but then they return the funds. Okay, thank you. Um, I have uh, three closing uh, questions, and, and then we are straight on time. Um, there th th also will be the last uh, questions. Um, uh, I will uh, ask question of all of you. But what are the most advantages of DeFi? Wants to react to the most advantages of FIFA. If, if oh. I can start, uh, it, it are the traditional advantages uh, of blockchain. So it is permissionless. Uh, you can't seize the funds. Uh, so that's for a lot of people uh, super relevant. And also, uh, you have a 24 uh, 7 uh, possibility to swap. Um, so that uh, yeah, that 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 is a big uh, adv advantage, I think. And, yeah, and and that it is borderless, so you can yeah. you can uh, yeah. uh, do peer to peer transactions with with everyone in in the world. And I think I think it's also very good for the for the uh, price uh, discovery. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something, Andre? Or... Yeah, yeah, I think I agree with. Uh... Uh, Dr. Kramer. So I think uh, there's a lot also the uh, 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 very advantage of uh, DeFi is the, the the innovation that can come from the uh, freedom of creating many of projects. So you can can uh, combine those projects together and you can create a new value of new product based on the current uh, uh, current uh, DeFi uh, project, something like that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if, I can, uh, if I can add to this, um, yeah. I would like to say that I find it an abomination that in this world we still have billions of people who don't have access to uh, basic financial services. So I really hope that we can use DeFi, and probably this will take many, many years, but that we can really use this technology to give everyone access to basic financial services. It really hurts my heart to see people in Cambodia who are not able to open a bank account. Why? Because they don't have an ID card. Or maybe sometimes because they, they look dirty. Or because the bank branch is too far from where they live. And with DeFi, I think everyone should be able to start their own bank uh, just from a mo mobile phone. And it doesn't need to be a smartphone, just SMS is enough for them to save money. I really hope that that will be uh, a reality soon. Yeah. I will hope it too, uh, Chai. It would be very nice. Um, I have a quick, uh, the, uh, not the last, but the first last question uh, for Tuan Bao. Um, can you say something about when trends become usual business? When do we think that it's going to be uh, usual business? Um, uh, sorry, Jan, I have not heard the question very clearly. Okay. So okay. No problem. Uh, can you say something about when trends become usual business? What kind of break even point you have that it's going to be 
business as usual in decentralized finance or in currencies or whatever. Uh, um, I think this is not likely that it will become a, a usual business, but then this is more likely to be an alternative. Um, it's just like Dr. Lim say is you have an alternative uh, to serve another group of customer that that's currently not available. I I more I see it more that way than uh, a kind of the usual business that in in the right. traditional way. Yeah, it's it's not instead of it's it's uh, you can choose for the one or the other if you want to. No, this is not that. This is like you have an alternative option, and uh, right. this is like if I like it, I can go with it. Otherwise, I can stay with the traditional business. Nobody forced me to choose one or the others. Yeah. And uh, they, they, they should be able to live together. Okay. Thank you very much and clear reaction. Uh, last but not least, the last question, and then we go to the closing. Um, I will ask it to uh, Charlie Lim. Uh, what do we think that the advantage for the industry is to adopt the blockchain? Um, sorry, which industry are you, are you talking about? Yeah, no, uh, the industry in, in general. Uh, Okay. But, but maybe you can uh, find that, uh, your reaction in the financial uh, uh, industry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think uh, every industry needs to look uh, at the blockchain technology to see whether it's useful or not. I can imagine there are some industries or there are some uh, some businesses that don't really require blockchain at all. If it doesn't require blockchain, please don't use blockchain. Don't, don't go through this headache and uh, implement the system that is useless. Um, but if you look look at the, at the financial industry, um, I see so many so many use cases. Um, cross border payments, I think, will be really huge. Um, the possibility to start your own bank just by opening opening your own wallet from your mobile phone. Um, I think the total phase of banking and the payment service providers will change as well. When I worked at a, a fintech company before I started the Soxion, people who pay with credit card, they had to pay three to 5% for every transaction they make. Three to 5%, that's a lot. Um, so I had a customer who wanted to buy an airplane, eight, 800,000 euros, and I had to set them up for 5% costs. <laughs> 5% of 800,000 euro, that is 40,000 euro just to buy an airplane. It was a private airplane. And um, what happened is that the credit card network didn't accept this payment. So I also believe that uh, an impact of blockchain is that we can get rid of that intermediary and give him the freedom to buy an airplane if he wants. <laughs> um, against very low cost. So, uh, I, you can get into so many more things in how you can uh, use blockchain to change the financial industry. These are a few that I just mentioned. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you later on in your own airplane, maybe somewhere and somehow. I think, I, no I, 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 think okay. I want to add uh, to that. Um, I think Amazon is creating their own blockchain application for the customer to replace the letter of credit used by banks. So now they have already created their own blockchain system for some of the very big customer that connect thousand of customer of that company. And so they get rid of the letter of credit, the whole thing, and then they save about a few millions on that dollars. Yeah. So that is one example of a lot of companies already adopt the blockchain inside there. Unfortunately, a lot of them are big technology companies. So we are, might be creating another kind of elephant is we are replacing the traditional buying by a big tech guy who has control over things, and then they, they create their own blockchain system. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chai, uh, Ronald, uh, Chuan, and Andrew for your presentation and your discussion. Um, it was nice to meet you this way and to have this discussion with us. Um, can I give the floor now to end to you to, for the closing? It's almost in the Netherlands 12 o'clock, so I think we can close it. So uh, I think thank you very much uh, for 
all of the participants uh, to listen and uh, all of the our uh, specialists and um, so the wonderful moderator who guide us and we I think that we also had a very interesting and, and, and rich experience discussion about the blockchain and how we apply this and how it's going on. So uh, thank you very much uh, for all of the your contribution. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's a uh, wrap of our webinar. So I would like to remind to all of you that we still have the second day of the blockchain webinar tomorrow, same time, 10 a.m. Uh, Netherlands time and 3 p.m. in Vietnam time. So all of you are invited, so please join. So, uh, you also can find more information on the ISEM UH fan page, LinkedIn, or website. And I hope you guys have a nice day. And many thanks to all of you, a moderator, panelists, and attendants again. Thank you, and see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.